speaker is Shavi Kar from Ralph University, from Ramapo College of New Jersey, and uh, her paper is Women as One Pantry. Each presenter should have like around 10 minutes. I'm going to time you if you will like one, if you have like one minute left, I'm going to wait to you guys, okay? Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Shelly, I'm from Ramapo College of New Jersey. I'm gonna read my paper to you on the Women as One campaign. Women's rights are a constantly discussed topic in today's media, bringing to light our knowledge and starting a big conversation. Some women's rights workplace, lack of women in a position of power, and access to equal opportunities. These are rights that need to be changed, and it all begins with the future generations. Women as One is a campaign that creates an open dialogue around women's rights and the opportunity for the younger generation to take charge of their own future. This campaign is important because it is empowering and it gathers women together to promote their own rights as a united force. There needs to be a way to promote health information and the equal opportunity and power to young girls in order for them to grow up in a society where they can take charge of their own lives. The main goal of this campaign is to join the forces of all women together and promote the rights that they all deserve in order for them to live to their fullest potential and not be forced into making decisions or controlled in any way. A secondary goal within this campaign is to open up the conversation in regards to women's rights and give the younger generation the comfort of feeling empowered and able to take a stand. Women as One is going to generate awareness and create conversations in regards to women's rights, specifically focusing on the younger generations, allowing them to gain knowledge and opportunity to take action. Education is going to be a large and important factor within the intended result of this campaign. The education system needs to begin incorporating women's rights for all. These young girls also need a role model and someone who has paved a path for them to walk down. Giving these girls someone to look up to allows them to see that anything is possible and there are people out there just like them who are achieving their dreams. This campaign has the possibility to change behaviors and social concerns throughout the world. Creating space for open conversations in regards to women's rights is a great short-term change as it opens the platform for young girls to feel comfortable bringing their voices to the forefront. Long-term changes will lead to the elimination of the gap of discrimination towards women and a stronger education for the younger students. By giving the younger generation more knowledge, it grants them the opportunity to change society's view on the rights all women deserve. The overall problem is the lack of rights that women have in today's society. There are several causes to this issue, like the lack of support, the lack of acknowledgement, no women's rights education, misrepresentation of women in power, discrimination in the workplace, and limited access to equal opportunities. Each of these issues expresses a strong right that a woman should have without thinking that it is another battle they will have to overcome. Some outcomes that will be fixed with this campaign are the growth of acknowledgement throughout younger generations, the chance to promote many women in power and share their voices, improving the education system for young girls to give them the chance to have a better understanding of women's rights and the decision of what they do with their opportunities and their bodies. Women's rights campaigns have been known for creating a viral following. There are so many reasons for these campaigns to stand out and perform well due to the high level of responsibility behind the fight. Three standout campaigns include the Women's March, the Me Too movement, and He for She. The Women's March was created by Teresa Shook, a retired lawyer living in Hawaii, when she posted on Facebook proposing a march in Washington, D.C. to stand up in support of all women the day after former U.S. President Donald Trump was elected into office. Thousands of people urged for the creation of the Women's March, and on January 21st, 2017, the day after Trump's inauguration, five million people marched across the globe, launching the movement. Since that day, there have been organized rallies and demonstrations throughout the year to defend women's rights. The mission behind the Women's March is to harness the political power of diverse women in their communities to create transformative social change. Every member of these marches are committed to dismantling systems of oppression through nonviolent resistance and building inclusive social and political structures using a feminist lens and guided by self-determination, dignity, and respect. The Me Too movement was founded back in 2006 by Tarana Burke as a movement to extend support and empathy to survivors of sexual violence by creating a larger network of survivors. This movement gained viral and global support in 2017 following the accusations of sexual misconduct by many women against famous Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein. The hashtag included with the Me Too movement went viral on social media and created a huge impact on several countries in the world as numerous high-profile celebrities, actors, producers, athletes, politicians, and CEOs 
or prosecuted and convicted for sexual misconduct. The purpose of this movement eventually became larger than just sharing one's experience of abuse and trauma because it taught people to listen and believe survivors, destigmatize, and validate the trauma and pain of these individuals. Me Too also became the voice of the survivors of sexual harassment and violence and is led by survivors for survivors. Lastly, He For She was founded by UN Women in 2014 as a movement aimed to break social norms by signing up primarily men and boys to support gender equality. The members believed that gender equality is not a women's issue, but a threat to global human rights. They engage boys and men in partnership with women in taking direct action to eliminate discrimination, violence, and oppression against genders, to stand in solidarity with women to create a bold, visible, and united force. The men involved with He For She are committed to working with women and with each other to build businesses, raise families, and give back to their communities. Since the launch of He For She, hundreds of thousands of men across the globe and from many walks of life have committed to this initiative as a change maker. I decided to dive deeper into the He For She campaign as it had a viral launch through social media that I hope Women As One is going to achieve. There was a study that explained the details behind the launch for he, of He For She. In order for the campaign to be successful, they conducted qualitative research through interviews, focus groups, observations, letters, photographs, and much more. Actress Emma Watson, best known for her roles in the Harry Potter franchise, became the voice and face for the initial launch, and she worked with the organization to create a speech that was then recorded and put on social media. September 20th, 2014, Emma Watson's game-changing speech was delivered on behalf of the He For She campaign at UN headquarters in New York City. Her speech was inspired by an incredible letter that had been sent in by a 15-year-old boy as he broadcasted his views about gender equality. Researchers began to dissect her speech in order to analyze the semantic roles and meaning within the script. As they analyzed the meaning of each sentence, they determined that Watson brought renewed visibility to the campaign due to her celebrity status and UN involvement. Celebrity support gives this campaign a greater chance for success due to the admiration from their fan bases. Throughout this campaign, there were different tactics that were incorporated, such as high-profile celebrities bringing in a large audience, inviting men to participate in the gender equality mission, and global outreach and immediate connection to a large, diverse group geographically and ethnically. Overall, these attributes gave this campaign a strong leg to stand on right from the launch. As I think of the success that he for she achieved, I compiled the details that I want to include in the development of Women as One. They gained a lot of social media attention, and as technology grows, it shows that it is not only for entertainment purposes, but, is it, but it is also beneficial in sharing information, educating people, and creating a social movement. Celebrities, politics, news, research, and so many more channels, channels are all available in one blog, tweet, or app. The ability to access social media so easily grants the thought that it was only a matter of time before campaigns were introduced to social media success. Celebrities have an exorbitant amount of public speaking experience, and as entertainers, they understand how to communicate with people to obtain fans. Therefore, even without the credibility of experience, Hollywood's biggest celebrities have become some of the most influential activists. Seeing how they have a social media presence of millions of followers, it allows them the opportunity to reach out to all of these people in an instant. The main purpose of He For She is to end gender equality, and the function is to obtain advocates for tangible changes. Emma Watson's speech was, was structured to address the continuing problems and offer several reasons for individuals' participation. She touches on women's rights, including the wage gap, personal body decisions, and privileges that, all not, that not all women are offered. These issues align with the similar focuses Women As One plan on covering. Women As One will generate celebrity endorsements and combine their efforts to grow their following. We will also utilize social media as it, as it is such a powerful tool for campaigns and focus on, on keeping it simple and effective. The target audience for Women As One aims to educate the younger generation through social media and work alongside any girls who want to take charge of their own future. These girls need to, need to gain the ability to make the decisions that impact their lives and grow that comfort of having that open conversation in regards to women's rights. There may be a constraint in regards to the age of some of the girls that want to make a difference, yet that also needs to be a factor that becomes eliminated as every girl should have an equal opportunity to represent themselves. Girls and all women will be able to have the conversation around what rights they want to have and how they want to show up and support. The goal is to feel as if the message in each post is being shared with each person individually as they scroll through their social media feed, allowing for interpersonal communication. 
although the overall campaign will be shared through mass communication because it is being broadcasted on social media and shared amongst million of, millions of people. The future we are trying to create is more inclusive with having girls and women take a hold of what they want for themselves, giving them the knowledge to best grow in a society they feel proud of. The message that we are trying to spread and promote is that all women should be the ones to stand up and represent themselves and create a guide in which they want to follow. The campaign shows women standing together as one while supporting each other. The message corresponds with the objective of the campaign by reaching out through social media where most people spend their time and begin to change the way social media influences young girls' lives. Since the campaign is going to be shared through social media platforms, it will show that social media doesn't have to be a place for the fabrication of one's life, but it can also be used to promote change. This campaign is aimed at giving girls a platform to share their stories or share their ideas for change. The combination of this campaign and the, achieve, and the advancement of social media is a perfect match. Women as One is aimed to share information by using influential women throughout the world to gain a diverse range of women, giving each person someone they can relate to. The stories behind each influential woman should be inspirational and aspirational, filled with emotion and expressing their ideas for change. There can be donation opportunities and links to stories in order to follow along these influential individuals. Having this campaign on social media allows it to be seen by so many people and gain the following in the most modern way possible. In order to gain the knowledge of the impact of this campaign, I created a questionnaire that will open, up, that will open the door to understand the anticipated audience. It is important to acknowledge the age range of those who are experiencing this campaign, as well as how much knowledge they have on the topic of women's rights. The questions are, what is your age? What is your gender? What is your highest level of education? Are you familiar with any women's rights? And which women's rights are most important to you? Where the options include education on women's rights, equal opportunities, fair workplace opportunities, promotion of women in power, and freedom of choice on their own bodies. Now that there has been an established visual concept, the next step is to form the projected budget for this campaign. Every detail has to be accounted for and maintained throughout the lifespan of this campaign. Celebrity endorsements can vary in cost depending on the level of fame that individual has achieved. Therefore, the range of cost goes from $5,000 to $25,000 per person. To gain the support from top celebrities, I would reach out to people that are on the Forbes 30 under 30 list as they are creating a huge impact at a young age. These individuals have the opportunity to gain support from an extensive diverse and diverse audience as they are some of the most influential people of the year. In order to keep a post active on social media, it costs $1,000 a month. However, it is free to obtain the hashtag for the campaign. Part of this campaign is working alongside celebrities and having them choose a specific nonprofit organization that benefits women's rights. Organizations such as UN Women, Womankind Worldwide, Gender at Work, International Center for Research on Women, and International Alliance of Women, just to name a few. In order to partner with these organizations, the Women as One campaign will have to pay $150 to each individual organization. Oh, sorry. I'm all saying. Uh, overall, the budget for Women as One will average at least $6,150 to the most $26,150. The look for the campaign remains simple and effective. Each influential woman involved with the post will be wearing a t-shirt that shows the hashtag for the campaign, Women as One, across the front in order to show support. Having each indi influential individual pick a nonprofit grows the goal of gaining a larger audience as well as providing support for these organizations and growing the knowledge within women's rights. Since this message will be seen by many, it opens the conversation to a larger audience and not just the target and primary audience. The more people that see this campaign, the more that will be able to make a difference in the future of women's rights. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Cristiana Barrente Carpizo. I am from Ramo College of New Jersey. My uh, major is Global Communications with a, a concentration in Visual Graphic Design and a minor in Spanish. Um, I had a presentation already, but it's, it's fine. So basically, I will explain to you why I felt most passionate about this campaign and how I came up with it. So when I wrote this essay when I was a sophomore, and basically, uh, I was part of the Student Government Association. And in the Student Government Association, I had a chair of diversity and inclusion. And basically, a lot of complaints that came by was that, you know, a lot of like minority, religious minority students did not have the opportunity to use the dining services that are offered at Ramapo College just because there is no 
uh, they do not follow, you know, their religious um, rules by separating, you know, food from being cooked in the same place as like red meat. Then uh, we're not able to eat because it was very heavily based on like red meat instead of like vegetarian options or even vegan options. And even BIPOC students felt um, that there was not enough multicultural food and ethnic foods offered at the Ramapo College which made, made them feel that they were not part of college, right? College is supposed to be an experience for everybody equally and therefore I got working in this campaign. And basically I want to ask you guys, you know, what uh, what does food mean to you and like was your college able to fulfill your needs? Um, well, I think food means a lot to me, obviously it's nourishment, but I think when I thought of the cafeteria as a college student, it was a place and with family, when you're sitting down for dinner or your loved ones, and the cafeteria is certainly a place where you meet and um, socialize and connect. Um, over hopefully a good meal. Um, I don't think the food was very good when I went to school. Uh, I, think I was also in the SGA at Drew and we pushed for just healthier food options, but I think also just being able to share experience with my peers was really I think food for me, it opens a new culture to me. Whenever I try a new cuisine, it is opening a new culture of people and when I visit the restaurant I also see people who are indigenous people through that culture. So it really opens a new door for me. And as for the second question, uh, I'm not really sure if the school that I went to provided much um, much of that because there weren't any um, many international students in there. But this was one thing that I did uh, speak about with one of my um, coordinators. So yeah. If not, it's okay, you know, your answers are very well, they are great. And that's basically what my campaign is aiming for. I, a lot of people, especially like but, uh, minorities, religious minority students, like back box students, identify a lot of like their culture within the food. It brings a lot of comfort because you have a, you share food with your loved ones. And that is like a form of like creating relationship with others. And if sometimes a college is not able to afford, uh, uh, to afford that, Therefore, it's not able. Some minorities are not able to um, create those type of relationships, which creates a, a greater um, difficulty for like minority students to create a connection within their within their college. And in basically, my problem in my problem tree, I explain how this issue arises from the systematic racism and from um, the religious. Um, majority which is Christianity which created basically this issue. It came to the point of like all these rules were imposed for everybody that not everybody follows. Therefore creating this issue of minorities, uh, religious minority students a lot of times have to be commuters since they are, they, are, they cannot eat at Ramapo College and therefore you know they, ha they do not enjoy the same experience as someone that is a European American that, it, that follows Christianity. And uh, for BIPOC minority students, a lot of times will feel that they are not welcome at the dining services, right? So they have to find comfort in other places. For example, myself, I am from um, Mexico, Mexico City. I moved to the United States when I was in, in 2018. And basically, you know, a lot of like what the uh, food I'm used to is like very heavy sauces, you know, very heavy spices and stuff like that. And th that was something that I couldn't find of comfort at my college, right? Um, I knew that if I was going to the Ramapo College's dining services, I was going to eat American food. There was not a chance for me to find Mexican food. So I had to look for outside resources on Ramapo College to eat my uh, food that made me comfort. Uh, therefore, um, a lot of like what I seen in my campaign was related to the Michigan Mi Michigan University um, a res a case study, and it's basically in this research they saw that the culture on the Rama on that college is basically they were very alcohol based, right? Like they were known for being a um, par a, a, par a party school which created like this like stigma of like more people drank more drinks than what I what they thought. So basically um, what it addresses is how difficult it is to change a culture within um, an institution, right? How do you um, do this successfully without um, 
making people feel, I guess, attacked because a lot of people a lot of times can feel um, bothered by it. So basically what they find out is that when you create like very uncontroversial and very empathetic, heartwarming um, like uh, me uh, medias to uh, post this, for example, like posters that basically it was about like three dogs, right? And it was basically regarding consent for like, remember that even in your drinking, like as for consent and that kind of stuff. Um, that's kind of like the publications made them feel very soft-hearted and that was able to like uh, for the students to take it in without feeling it was controversial. It was just very empathetic and very something that everybody can enjoy. So therefore in 2010 when they redo um, the research they saw that now the pers that perspective of like um, these alcohol drinks it actually decreased within the Roman, which sorry, within the Michigan University, which meaning that the culture of like heavily drinking it had decreased at that university. Um, so basically, that study is what helped me um, guide myself of how I want um, the culture to change at Roman College. I want to create like well, I created because I did this in sophomore year when I was in SEA, um, very soft-hearted and uh, posters that basically started the conversation, right? Like, um, what is it that you wanna see in the dining services? Um, I created a, a survey that actually asked that and it was a, a, for all the students to fill out to say you know, what they wanted to see at the dining services. Um, I actually received a lot of feedback and it was great I was no longer in SGA, but I do work on the, the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And because of that campaign, it actually increased the uh, multicultural food, ethnic foods, and even like religious um, foods. Uh, one of the things that we did is basically offer a dinner for like all the students that practice Ramadan, that it was like different meals other than the what is offered in the dining services. So, um, Basically, in order for Ramapo College specifically to uh, have this campaign done successfully, we will have to ask for like a grant of like um, I believe it's two hundred thousand dollars, just because you will have to build a separate building to put the foods that are being handled religiously, since some of the food, since some religions, you cannot combine the food that is not respect, is not followed religiously, since it will break. It will be basically considered like contaminated, and like that will cost like I believe one thousand two, one hundred twenty thousand dollars in order to build, and then sixty thousand dollars is for um, hiring new personnel and training in order to handle these foods, and then like ten thousand dollars will go to the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion in order to start the conversations. Uh, for different, you know, events where they have like um, uh, a multicultural foods in order to start these conversations so that people understand, you know, well, major European Americans understand how religious minorities and BIPOC students might feel at Ramapo College and therefore like help advocate for the minority community at Ramapo College and that's basically it. Any questions or concerns? I have a question. The grant that you speak of that they will have to you know, to, per, to, to build the other building and to uh, hire personnel and then the $10,000 to, to encourage dialogue with cultural food festivals, I'm, I'm assuming. Is that for just one calendar year or would that be for the lifetime of the the or that would be every year that this they will have to contribute, have this grant, not to build, of course, but to have personnel and to have these conversations. Is is what's the cost over the lifetime? And I know you don't, you want to, you want this particular uh, idea to continue to stay and be a part of Ramapo's legacy, so to speak. So, how do you fund that over the years? Do you do go for grants every year? How do you fund it over the years? Well, that, uh, it, it is correct that that grant is for like, you know, in order to this to exist, will be like only one 
year, month, year, but that it that doesn't directly affect the students. What it will be continuously, it would, would that uh, affect, I guess, the tuition to increase a little bit, but at the end of the day, that's something that was discussed within SGA, that students don't mind if it increases like a little bit as long as they're able to use it, because at the end of the day, like they're already paying a certain amount, and yet they're not able to use it because it doesn't offer the food that they want. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and I have more questions that I'll wait to the end, but just on that point, with that, very precise question, but would that be increasing the tuition only for the students that would be intending on using that cafeteria, or just across the board? So in Ramapo College, it actually depends if you have like a meal plan, mm -hmm. and usually they force the freshmen to have like a meal plan, even though if you are a commuter. So just to make sure that they they do not eat, like make sure that they eat right. So uh, a lot of like these amounts like changes, like I believe like the biggest, which is the ultimate is like $7,000, no, like um, $5,000. Um, but ultimate is like, oh, you can eat it all the time whenever you want and stuff like that, right? So uh, in, in essence, everyone is paying for everything. Therefore, like everyone is paying for the same use of the dining services, however, not everyone is receiving the same service, right? Because not everyone is being fulfilled regarding um, their their food necessities in their religious perspective and their cultural perspective. Hi, I'm Tori, and today I'm going to talk about my campaign proposal on how to improve student athlete mental health. To start, this topic does interest me. I played field hockey at Rampo, and my college career just ended this past fall. So this is the first semester I'm learning to navigate college life without any athletic constraints. It's been weird. Um, I can stand here today and say I'm lucky, grateful, and fortunate that my mental health has never put me in a harmful situation. Um, I've had great teammates, a great group of friends, uh, my family that has always supported me. But I can also stand here and say that my mental health is nearly, not nearly close to perfect all the time. There were moments I wanted to give up and quit. There were moments I saw the struggle of my own teammates struggling with mental health. Um, did I ever do anything about it? No. Did I try to validate that others had it worse, that I was only Division three, and that I should be grateful I got to play a sport in college? All the time. But here's the thing. On the checklist of everything a college athlete, athlete must succeed at, mental health is usually not put on it. Instead, mental health is becoming the quiet crisis in college sports. Alarmingly, a recent NCAA study found that college athletes will experience more mental health issues than their non-athletic counterparts. The study also pointed out that college athletes are less likely to seek out professional help than non-athletes when struggling. The, the stats are startling. 33% of all college students experience significant symptoms of depression, anxiety, or other mental health conditions. Among that group, 30% seek help. But of college athletes with mental health conditions, only 10% do. In the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, more athletes have been reaching out about their mental health battles. The NCAA found that in most cases, the rates of reporting these concerns are 1.5 to two times higher than in NCAA pre-pandemic studies. In the study, fewer than half the students surveyed by the NCAA felt that they would be comfortable personally seeking support from a mental health provider on campus. Only about 50% of athletes reported that coaches take mental health concerns of their student athletes seriously. A part of an already vulnerable age group, collegiate student athletes also experience stress stressors other, others their age do not. This includes practice and travel commitments, performance expectations, in addition to the normal pressures of college life with classes, relationships, jobs, and more. All the time, performance is considered more important rather than the personal growth and character development that builds a foundation for well-being. This is due to the fact that college athletes have usually been taught their entire life to be tough and push through. Push through fear, failure, feeling bad, or down. It's ingrained in the culture of sports. As a result, athletes often avoid disclosing mental health concerns, especially if the perceived negative consequence results in being rejected by teammates or coaches. Stigma further worsens when the stigma further worsens the problem of student athlete mental health as it inhibits open dialogue, education, and the development of resources. Consequently, the moment an athlete believes they are struggling mentally, they go to deny it, disregard it, and ignore it. It can be embarrassing, confusing, and scary. The idea of reaching out for help is often not even considered an option to most athletes. Declining mental health can affect performance on the field, track, court, or pool, and lead to a higher risk of physical injury. 
This is concerning because physical injuries are cited as one of the most common and major stressors faced by student athletes, and it can trigger, create, unmask, or worsen mental health. Just six months into 2022, six college athletes had died of suicide correlating to mental health. Katie Meyer, a Stanford soccer player, Alana Miller, a Southern cheerleader, Lauren Burnett, a James Madison softball player, Sarah Schultz, a Wisconsin cross country runner, Jaden Hill, a Northern Michigan track and field athlete, and Robert Martin, a Binghampton lacrosse player. Their deaths, have not, their deaths have shown that even with the attempts by the NCAA to better the topic of mental health, it is still not enough for student athletes. The question that arises is why is mental health in college athletics still struggling with the NCAA attempting to do more? The issue is that while the NCAA requires individual college athletic departments to follow guides, game plans, suggestions, and more, it is up to the individual colleges and coaches to actually enforce and help their athletes with what the NCAA gave them. This is where my campaign called More Than Sports comes in. The goal is to simply help make mental health more of a priority in the individual athletic programs and educate others on emotional well-being and normalize help seeking and taking care of yourself. The main message is to eliminate the stigma surrounding the conversation about mental health and make it more of an open conversation. While the target audience is heavily focused on college athletes, the secondary audience is just as important, and it includes coaches, family, and friends of student athletes, because they help in guiding those athletes who are on edge when it comes to getting help or needing a little push to seek guidance. They can also look for warning signs or be a safe place to listen to their athlete talk. Coaches need to pro be properly trained to the best of their ability when it comes to understanding mental health, knowing warning signs, setting boundaries, and creating support systems. In order to communicate my campaign, I would use posters on social media. This would be my first channel of communication because the college group is always on their phones and reposting and taking in a lot of things whether they realize it or not. In a similar way, people read posters without always consciously paying attention to them. Eventually, I would like to bring in a panel of those athletes who have personally struggled and can tell their stories and share their experiences about mental health with the student athlete body. It would consist of professional players or players who have str struggled in college College. Hearing other stories and experiences is beneficial because it lets the athlete know they are not alone, have support, and can also overcome the difficulties. Collegiate athletic departments often lack mental health resources. At bigger universities, there may only be one counselor asked to serve the needs of more than 20 teams. At smaller schools, there may not even be a dedicated mental health staff. To fix this, there needs to be better mental health care at each individual college. It starts with eliminating the stigma that you have to be in crisis to seek help changing the narrative around the mental health conversation and understanding the performance pressure of being a student and being an athlete. Some of the key components discussed include making and creating healthier environments for student athletes, pre-participation mental health screenings, procedures for identifying and referring student athletes, reducing the suicide rate among student athletes, having more resources, and allowing student athletes to have mental health days without being punished for missing a practice. It is vital for athletes to address how they are feeling and seek help right away when they first think they are struggling. There has to be a cultural shift in the sports world that understanding mental health is important and it is not a weakness to seek help. It is just like a physical injury that needs treatment. However, no matter how much is done, mental health will continue to be a part of the athletic community and be a thing that athletes have to face. Having a support system from individual colleges and coaches so athletes can stay engaged will help with progress moving forward. The institutions not only need to listen to the NCAA, but also their own players. Six deaths in a year is too much, one death is too much. These young student athletes play in college to continue playing the sport they loved as a child, not to face mental battles that make them question if their life is worth living. Every athlete needs to remember that they are more than what their sport defines them as on the field. And that is all. All right, so. Um, my name is Sayyid and I'm going to talk about uh, misinformation on social media with regards to COVID-19. As we saw that um, a lot of that conversation started taking place once the pandemic came in. But the main thing is that this is not an old idea. This has been there for quite some time. Uh, so there's a lot of scholarly work done um, prior to this pandemic that talks about misinformation, specifically the work of Van Dyke, who through the particular discourse scholars. Or even Marshall McLuhan has touched a little bit upon it uh, about how misinformation uh, can seep into media. And as we all know, our media is a social construction where a lot of our opinions, ideas, and even decisions are based on what we see on media. And 
Um, so there's an authenticity contract between the producers and the audience, which is not said openly, but it is there. We believe what we see because of the high-handed attitude of, for example, if we see something on BBC, we are going to believe it more than what we see on ABC. You know, that's how things work. Um, so the reliance has increased on social media because post-pandemic, and the reason is because of less face-to-face -face conversations. We relied more on more on social media, and that's how our relationship with social media was increased, especially um, with young people who were uh, uh, on social media at all times, even before it. So. Uh, it's important to, to differentiate between misinformation and disinformation in this conversation. Disinformation is basically if a person intends to cause harm. So they intend to float information that is not correct. Misinformation is not purposely done on purpose. It can be done uh, uh, without the per person knowing that they are uh, floating around misinformation. But for this study, it, only misinformation is, 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 is used as an, um, as an umbrella term. And I should have mentioned before, this is an ongoing study, and it's still in the progress. Uh, so the research question proposes that, was social media as a platform used to instigate misinformation about COVID-19? Uh, to kind of see that, was this used as a tool to propagate that kind of information? Uh, misinformation, I should say. So the methodology. COVID-19 Global Misinformation Dashboard is a, is a global dashboard which collects all the fact-checking. There are various um, um, places, who, political fact, Snopes, I use Snopes. So these are different fact-checking organizations. So this dashboard puts everything in. You put the date range in and pulls out what the claims were, what the flaws, true. So 461 articles came up just by Snope, out of which um, only the ones which had social media and that sort of thing was were collected, still in the progress. Uh, so, so this is one of the examples that um, I would like to uh, portray here, which is this video was shared, and this was CEO of Pfizer uh, stating that there are microchips which are going to be used in pills, and then and people are going to ingest it. It was massively shared. As you can see, there are two around 3,000 tweets, retweets. Um, but this was debunked because. Uh, this was actually a video from 2018 at World Economic Forum, and they were talking about people who had uh, bipolar disorders, and the patients do not usually take pills, so this is how the insurance company will know if they have or not. And then a second example is that um, slices of lemon in a cup of hot water can save your life. This was also floated a lot around, and even there was a person who is a, a, a big YouTuber, has a whopping 500,000 500, followers, and he explained in detail that how this can prevent. Uh, and then um, Dr. Caroline Apogin, a professor from medicine, debunked it and explained that it has nothing to do with it. And the third one is, of course, pre former President Donald J. Trump, who quoted that um, common flu people died around uh, 27 to 70,000 per year. And right now we have 22 deaths. Um, so underlying context is that think about it, like, is it even true? And then you will notice a second comment, uh, a second tweet by DC Drawn three months after that, quoting the same exact thing. So that misinformation was still being floated because it was coming from a high-handed uh, president and then floating it in the masses. Um, so this is what the nature of misinformation has been in, in COVID. Um, so it really hinders the, the, and CDC had to step in again and again, WHO had to step in again and again to debunk these claims, but this was not a normal misinformation. This app actually had impact on people's health as this was a global crisis. So I think um, as I move forward with this research, there's going to be more things that will come up and I will be happy to share. Thank you. We have seven minutes left, so if you have any questions for our participants, please go ahead. Yes. I have a question. That was a very interesting um, study that, that you are beginning, that you're embarking on. So I know it's early, but do you have any thoughts on how we can short circuit misinformation since as you said, it's something that people are passing on that's not true, but they're not passing it on to be malicious, they're just passing it on. Uh, is there anything we can do about that now? 
if you really ask me, I don't want to be <laughs> go on that dark phase, but it is we are too late for that when it comes to social media. Because if you see traditional media, uh, first there's a producer, editor, presenter, it goes through a lot of phases. With social media, boom, mm -hmm. one click, it's gone, 500 people can see it now. Mm -hmm. And these debunks are actually way later than it actually came out. Mm -hmm. So debunking this is not going to do any good, mm -hmm. So, but we can be hopeful. Okay. Well, I feel very hopeful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Do you have any? You know, she, uh, Dr. Palmer, said that some of these, some of this information, this misinformation, is being uh, spread unintentionally or unknowingly. But do you have like a any stats on information that misinformation that is intentionally spread and knowingly? Spread? Then they're knowingly spreading this misinformation. I think I think if a person in this age and time is just putting something out there because there's a WhatsApp or text message or Facebook Messenger message, mm -hmm. and not checking it, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what the problem is. Like because these conversations then come become public discourses, mm -hmm. and people discuss about it. Mm -hmm. So I think fact checking is something we really need to look Absolutely. into as individuals. Mm -hmm. How do you even filter that in like the freedom or freedom of speech kind of context? I think the blue tick works. <laughs> you know, Twitter has a blue tick, which means this person is authentic. Now they pay for it because Elon mm -hmm. Musk owns it. Now, if a person with the pay blue tick it. is floating misinformation, mm -hmm. we really need to question that. Maybe take the blue tick away so but that so everybody you can pay for that. So that yeah, that so everybody knows they floated misinformation. Integrity. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe saying. maybe that that might work, but we're just talking about Twitter. There's Instagram, mm -hmm. Facebook, so sure, right. I have a question about just in general. All of you are from Ramapo, yes? No. I'm from Monmouth. Oh, from I'm sorry. I, oh, I apologize then. Oh, um, those three are from. Okay. Um, this, so you, did you do these for public relations courses? Is that how it started for these campaigns or? No. The research that I we're just are yeah I guess it's different for everyone. I was just curious about um, the practical steps to be able to implement, and I guess it's kind of a broad question for just everyone that's been involved in sharing these campaigns. Um, so I, yeah, I could just open it up for anyone wants to respond. Yeah. Um, I think it's different like for everybody. Like you're a comm major, right? Like you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a comm major, but like first my major was like global communications, like global media. Yeah. And basically like that made me come into this class because I was like, um, told me to, well, yeah, I wanted to go into social marketing, which is like helping um, charities to like do a campaign. And this class basically, they told me that it will prepare me to like, what it's like to do a campaign for like, you know, uh, charities and nonprofits, but um, I love it and it implemented more. It helped me to implement it more for like my studies or well or how I participated at Ramapo College, like in SCA. And really, I guess for me, it just like it, it's a it's a class that was needed for my major, but it's a class I don't really take in it because it helped me in a lot of different ways. And are you actually able to propose this to the administration at your university? Are you doing it? Is that in the works? Have you done that uh, already? Yeah, i done that already. It was shown to the Ramapo College Dining Services. Okay. So it has to be, because I started this in SEA as a, a Equity and Diversity Inclusion Chair, it has to be followed by whoever is next to me since I didn't like, I'm not in that longer position. But as I work as an intern at, in the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion and Compliance, like I do get to do like a constant work regarding um, the campaign that I did, even though I cannot continue under SGA, yeah. if I if you get what I'm saying. Yeah, and you're also presenting it as a poster at a college fight. Oh yeah, well I did that. Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah. Just all the ideas and the issues you have instructors at the City Hall, so touching on issues that we see, certainly in the mental health and health athletes, um, obviously issues that regarding feminism, foods, I just, I, they're all great, they're really great theoretical ideas, and yeah, we'd love to see some of these things kind of put into, yeah, put into place more so. And this is not the initial question, it is a comment, but um, there are quite a few student athletes that have really opened up about mental health, 
uh, concerns. And you know, it's, we've been talking about what's beneath the surface when it comes to how students might appear. And I know that was very true for uh, the Stanford athlete and many other athletes. Um, so I had many students who kind of would appear to be here sort of, how to say this, a typical, happy, lucky, very academically uh, successful and social athletes, and then you know, doing their presentations in my course on um, raising awareness for mental health. So I just um, kind of wanted to acknowledge that great, great presentation. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Would you really, if you said you had a mental health issue, uh, would you really be told you cannot miss practice? That they, would that really happen? I think you would be told you could miss practice, but then there'd be like a repercussion of game time or, like I don't know personally like with my coach like or grandpa, but I, it's definitely like if you miss practice there's consequences. And it's like, how do they validate like, that's how you actually feel versus, oh, like I just didn't do my assignment and I'm gonna use it as an excuse. So there's like a bunch of different ways it could go, but I think it definitely, I don't, I think there would, there would be a consequence to it, unfortunately. Okay, great, I think we are just out of time. But thank you everyone for coming to the session and thank you all the participants for